Hi, right, good morning, Kiran, and good, good morning, everybody. I see some familiar names and faces as part of today's activities. Um, what I'm going to do is to present on what, um, what is being described as the use of open sources in coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to take a slightly different slant than perhaps was originally envisaged on this subject. Uh, because uh, those of you who have participated in events involving me in the past would know that I have, a very, I have some very strong views on the question of the journalism of verification and what are the attributes we as journalists bring to the journalism of verification. And a lot of it has to do with the journalists themselves. Uh, who you are and what is your personal predisposition to issues when it comes to your journalism practice. So there's a slide that I have when I present on, on journalistic verification, which looks at three or four concentric circles. And these circles would represent the range of contacts available for a journalist to produce verifiable information. So the outer ring, and I do, I'm not using it here today, but I just want to explain it before I get into the presentation. The outer ring would be somebody who somebody else said or read or listened to or looked at. This, the inner ring would be this somebody who is communicating with you. So it's so, sort of like in contact tracing, you're hearing about primary contacts, secondary contacts. And if you have community spread, think about the story as something that's generated from these different points. But the, the inner circle, the, in the core of all of this, and the single most reliable source of any information you can reproduce as a journalist is, and I've taken um, uh, answers from, from participants, who would be the most single most reliable source of information or data or news that you as a journalist would produce? I'm seeing Annalisa there. Good morning, and Wendy, and to the panel. Good morning, and participants. Um, I normally I would go straight to the person or to the source of the information. I, I would try to get to the the person who the first contact. Yes, so your primary not a secondary or tertiary. But you know that there's there that's is what a, I would try to get to. There's a source that's even better than that, you know. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for being late. I'm Marsha Brown, representing Jamaica Statistical Society. Yes. Yes. So, the, Annalisa, that's a, that's a good point. I'll come into that. But there's an even better source, more reliable, more trustworthy source than the primary source, than the, the person who, who, who has the information, who can be relied upon to have the information. One last guess before I move on, because I want to focus on that particular source to begin with. The person doing the test, the person who conducted the test. The that's, medical. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a primary source as well. Okay, but I'm not only talking about COVID-19 here, I'm talking about like any story. Generally. Generally. Yeah. Okay. Good Nazim morning, here. I would say. I would say the person itself, the victim or whoever itself, if they are alive. And uh, okay, yes. And uh, as I see, Spark, Sparkle, that you responded. I didn't um, get to get to. Sorry, my my bad. No. Good morning again, <laughs> Mr. Gibbs. It's Glenda and Dillion from Costa, a student. Okay. <laughs> Hi, good yes, morning, Wesley, and good morning to everyone. Yes. Um, I raised my hand because just before Glenda said the victim, I was wondering, since we're on the topic of open sources, probably uh, secondary information from other journalists because they might have already done the groundwork to get 
information from the primary source. You're going in the right direction because let me, let me, I'll, cut, I'll cut to the cheese because I only have one hour for the session, right? Okay. The single best and most reliable source is you. If you were there, if you had seen it, if you had experienced it, you are the most, hopefully, because most of us are not into lying to ourselves, right? Or misleading ourselves. Most of us, not all of us. I know some people don't mind fooling themselves, right? But you are the single most important source, reliable, verifiable source. So if you are there and you as a journalist saw it, if you as a journalist, as the journalist experienced it, then you are the most um, important source, verifiable source. And as a result, I want to open today by looking at this whole issue of sources by beginning with us, by beginning with journalists, with you, and what are your obligations as what I would describe as the first source. Now, the WHO guide on, on coverage of, of the pandemic doesn't describe it as the first source. That's my terminology. But the first, but they, they essentially are saying that in order for the COVID-19 story to be properly reported, there are certain obligations on the part of the journalists or certain attributes that the journalist needs to bring to the story. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is not an ethics um, discussion. This is a discussion basically on the sources. And I just want to emphasize the importance of you and what you bring to the story. Marsha Brown has her hand up. Marsha. Um, again, morning. So I'm not a journalist, so to speak. I'm a statistician. But in population studies, one of the sources that we use is used by sometimes talking to family members. Yes. Um, this is important, especially in cases where you have mortality. And in demographic study, we talk about the sisterhood method because family members, especially siblings, would actually know what the person experienced. They would have some level of communication and they are, they're also a reliable source of saying, well, these are the early symptoms. You know, originally he or she thought it was um, the flu or he or she thought it was because they got wet in the rain the day. And then afterwards, this is how it deteriorated. Yes. Now, you see, now that's a very good point. And I'm coming to that. But even before that, the journalist who is leaving the newsroom to cover the story or who's making the call or who's making contact with this family, there are certain attributes they need to bring to the table first. Because uh, the journalists bring a lot to the table in terms of their prior knowledge, their own personal experience, their own prejudices, and their own perspectives on things. And that's why number one on this list of requirements as the first source, and I'm, I'm describing the journalist as the first source, the initial source. This is the person who is going to make the call, who's going to visit the family, is going to conduct the interview, is going to pull the information together. What are the attributes you have to bring to this scenario? To be ethical and responsible, to be socially responsible, to bear in mind that particularly when dealing with issues of public health, that the temptation to be alarmist and sensational about is, is very, very, um, it's, it's a huge temptation because of course you're dealing with very serious things and things that attract a lot of attention and therefore, and this is this subject, this um, session is not about this in particular. Um, you know, we are usually minded to refrain from use such as the deadly coronavirus. Um, and expressions such as that, that that tend to bring to the bring to the fore certain features of a challenge that we understand to be the case, but the, your your role. Is not that your role is not to um, to create or to generate 
um, different kinds of um, sensations about it or to be alarmist about it, but to, sim but to present what you consider to be facts, verifiable facts that you can use for your stories. So you're communicating facts and truthful information. You're using reliable, scientific, truthful and verified sources. And the pandemic is a perfect example of where as journalists, we need to tread very carefully with respect to our use of sources. Uh, the, it's a public health emergency, a pandemic, and therefore there should be a heavy reliance on scientific, on the science of it. Uh, in fact, that's the overwhelming prerogative or, or, or requirement, which is to pay attention to the science. Uh, the truthfulness of the science in terms of the representation of data and statistics and those empirically uh, verifiable aspects of, of, of news and information. I'm going to make a comment later on about this. Uh, I, I'm, I have seen throughout the region in, in that there has been a heavy reliance on the usual suspects, chief among them politicians. So something happens that's of a public health nature and some of the main sources of most of the, the material reproduced um, in some cases ha has been the politicians. So who are the kind of people we're looking at? Scientists, researchers, public health officials, academics who have spent some time looking at these things. Um, report on the measures that are taken because the measures are a huge component of coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you would notice that as something that has been new to the world, the various measures have differed from country to country and from region to region. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago represents, uh, 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 is, resides along the more extre extreme spectrum of interventions. And even within the region, you can see where other governments um, have adopted a different kind of um, different sets of approaches to the extent that when we discuss the CARICOM bubble, travel bubble, for example, Trinidad and Tobago is exempted because of certain um, factors and others are included because of other factors. But I'll come into that in a short while. Just going through this thing about what, uh, what is the mindset you as a journalist will be taking to, to, this, to the, the question of COVID-19? Report on patients recovering. Um, and the colleague who commented a little while ago um, spoke about the families, um, communities, uh, with all due care and attention, of course. Um, and then finally, there is a requirement or there is a recommendation that in the reporting that you touch on what would be a possible solution or means of addressing the particular um, situation being faced. So just very quickly, it, it, this was not envisaged to be part of this presentation, but in keeping with my philosophy that the the journalist is the single, in, the, in terms of a story, in the context of the writing of a story, the journalist and the predisposition of the journalist and everything that the journalist brings to the table becomes a principal, a principal factor. Even among us gathered for this call this morning, um, we would all bring different perspectives um, because of personal experience, because of community experience and so on. I, I am probably one of the few over 60s in the group here. Um, so uh, one of the things I was very concerned about when they talk about, about um, the elderly, I was very concerned about a very specific <laughs> definition. I mean, who were they calling the elderly? I am over 60 and I do have comorbidities. And therefore, I fit into a certain kind of profile when it comes to this question. So you'll find that my personal predisposition and some of the things that I would pay attention to, most of you won't automatically pay attention to. For like the, the use of elderly, for example. 
Any of you, let me invite some um, comment. Did, did any of you um, consider what is what was very loosely thrown out there as a description of the elderly in all of this? I know our demography lady there would have um, may have a response to that. But let me hear from one of you. Yes, the I. Yes, I'm sorry. sure because for us, um, being elderly is defined chronologically. So once someone is 60 years and over, we define them as elderly. Either you have young elderly and older elderly. Young elderly go between like 60 to like 75. Those are persons who are more physical, usually more physically fit, able to still contribute and to work. And then you have the older elderly that goes from 76 all the way up. Right. Well, I hope people see the point that I'm making here. So I personally, from my personal standpoint, as a journalist who has been looking at this question and writing about it, writing my opinion about it through my column, one of the things that I am bringing to the table is my perspective as somebody who is being described, and some of us uh, don't really see ourselves in this category, but we are, at least clinically, belong to the categorization of the elderly. Now, throughout the reporting on it, on, on, the, on the issue, and I've seen a lot of regional reporting, not only talking about Trinidad and Tobago, I see like passing reference to, let us say someone who has passed as a result of the disease, that the person was el an elderly male with comorbidities. I begin seeing myself there. And then I'm saying, but maybe um, a lot more light can be shed on what is exactly is meant by that. Bearing in mind, of course, the ethical concern about privacy and about the uh, patient confidentiality, which is a very serious issue that we have to deal with. And I think that in some respects, when I see some of the questions being asked and some of the issues being raised, I am not too sure sometimes whether we have learned the lessons from the HIV AIDS experience that we thought we had learned in terms of the of stigma, in terms of the, the requirement of patient confident, confidentiality. So that's, that's us. That's who we are. But what are we required to do? What is our mandate? Our mandate is to write stories. And the more stories, the merrier the better. But it's not simply a question of writing stories. I, I know people who are on the news, just like Annalisa and so on, you are expected to churn out um, the stories. And these simply cannot be stories about the, the raw figures that are announced by the ministries of health or the, the measures or changes to the measures. We need stories that tell the story of the pandemic. And bearing in mind, as I said, a lot of the, there are a lot of ethical and other concerns that inhibit our ability to tell these stories. Last week, for example, we had um, Mr. Cunningham from BuzzFeed, uh, who operates at a global level in North America and so on, and he spoke about oh, why isn't there, uh, in, his, in his context, um, nurses were a, a, a major source of information. And we have to remind them that in the Caribbean context, where the state health system dominates, the workers in the public health system are constrained in terms of their ability to speak to the press. So there's a, there's a context to this. And unless you want to go the way of um, anonymous sourcing, which is not ideal, because that's the least rel reliable um, attribute that you can bring to a story, uh, an anonymous source, particularly if it is a single anonymous source, then, you, um, then you're going to run into problems in terms of telling the story accurately. The ability to clarify terms. I'm coming to that in a little while because there are resources that can help us to understand some of the new language that we are coming across now in the face of the pandemic. Um, it, it's like, it's, it's the same way for any other subject. As Kiran would have said, one of the things 
um, that I've, I've written about. In fact, there, is a, uh, there was a book published by the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas and the section that I dealt with had to do with um, the migration issues in the Caribbean. And what I found was that the languaging of the stories um, made for a situation such as we are facing in Trinidad and Tobago today, where you find a lot of um, stigma, you, know, you have a lot of discrimination, prejudice, and, um, and all the negatives that go along with um, misreporting and misconceptions about other human beings and their rights. So we also have an obligation to clarify the terms. We, this new vocabulary that has come along, we need to first understand the, ter the terms so that when we use them, we know exactly what we're talking about and we can explain them to the audiences. Social media. Uh, I think that all of us here, the, the, the practicing journalists have a, a social media presence. What are we using the social media presence to do? Okay, true, it's good that people know what we had to eat last night and it's our birthday and whatever it is, <laughs> but the, the, with the background of the mass of information that we have access to, the use of social media, some, I know in some newsrooms, it's a requirement of the job to post on, on social media um, using Twitter in particular, but I know in some countries, Guyana, for example, there's a heavy reliance on Facebook. We'll talk a little bit more about that when uh, towards the end. We need reliable information from expert sources. Who are the expert sources? You need to make a decision about who you consider to be the expert sources. Is it the Bush medicine doctor from down the road? Is it the, the priest or the pundit or the imam? Who would you consider to be an expert source? with respect to the scientific information needed for you to report the pandemic properly. And then this huge one, which is managing the conspiracy theories. And there is a train of, of thought um, that pays regard to what you consider to be, what is considered to be um, a disproportionate balance because, you know, there is this notion of balance in our stories that you, um, you apply unequal, unequal positions on things in order to represent what you would consider to be balance. So would we use flat earth theory to counterbalance the climate change discussion or the or a discussion about international travel? Um, do we use, do we use, pay attention to the anti-vaxxers uh, as opposed to the, the high number, the huge proportion or um, a huge volume of expert with expert advice and information on the efficacy of vaccination? So we. We need to be mindful of the, the conspiracy theories and the myths that are making the rounds. And you know that we would know from our um, experience that we don't have to look very far to see where um, conspiracy theories and sort of myths associated with the pandemic are uh, actually held close by very senior people in our society. The management of disinformation. Now, for some reason, and uh, this is regional, so I'm not looking at any one country in particular, but it has particularly come to the fore since in 2020, we, have see, we are seeing a flood of elections. Throughout the English-speaking Caribbean, we have had elections in Trinidad and Tobago, in St. Kitts, we had election, well, Suriname, not English speaking, but it's a CARICOM country. We had Suriname. We had the end of the five month um, trauma of Guyana. Um, we have, now we have elections coming up in Belize, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and we have the by election in Barbados. And I even might have missed because we had election in Anguilla. 
um, you speak about Caribbean, Cariforum, the Dominican Republic. So we, we are living in an era, in, at a time in a year, where you have this flood of elections. And you know that this information and elections in our context, not only in our context, globally, this information is, is not part and parcel of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with elections and, and political contests of all different kinds. So managing this information is important. Sorry, somebody coming. Okay. Then I, I, I spoke about this before, which is avoiding the false balance. It's a false balance on the climate change um, question, for example, when you believe that you can bring balance to a climate change story by um, citing information from um, the, 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 the loony bunch that, that's still in the category of climate change denial. In the same way we have COVID denials and COVID deniers, people who think it's a, it's a big conspiracy and that has something to do with the Chinese and Bill Gates and, and um, call it um, things that, that are inserted in your body via the swabbing and so on, pure rubbish. Then you're dealing with a situation in which fear and uncertainty prevails. In fact, the this, this single most important psychological impact and the experts have been talking about this, uh, is the, the rising phenomenon of fear and uncertainty and what that is doing to our society. In some instances, it's because of mismanagement of the information by officials, um, aided and abetted on some occasions, not all the time, by journalists and the journalism we produce. And the final, and this is me, Anybody who knows me talking about, about journalism, particularly the newcomers to journalism, I think that one of the most, if not the most important quality, human quality, you can bring to the job of journalism is humility. Uh, we work in a uh, profession where you have star boys and star girls that emerge overnight. I'm in the business for 40 years now. Um, and it has taken me that time to recognize that the star boy and star girl thing is scenario works against you as a professional and works against the profession of journalism. The, the concern that there are things we need to know needs to be our guiding light. And if we apply these measures, if we apply these things, then we get into, then we are better equipped to handle the mandates of the, of the pandemic. The contextualizing of stories as opposed to the mere throwing out of information. So what's the context? What, 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 are, what is the geography? What are the demographics? What are the, what are the differences? What are the sectoral connections to the stories that we're presenting. I'm not against putting out the raw data. It's very important that we have the raw data. And I think in most instances in the Caribbean, the public officials have been pretty good at presenting us with the raw data. Whatever the skepticism about thing, I, I don't subscribe to the view that politicians consider it helpful to gerrymander the figures in cohort or in concert with an, an entire network of public servants and technical people and scientists. Uh, because if you think about the vastness of the conspiracy to manipulate the figures and to present a false sense of the reality, then you would realize that, um, then you would tend to be a very skeptical about the conspiracy theories that talk about the suppression of the data because in any event, it's not helpful to any government, any uh, public health system to have a, a false sense, to present a false sense of what's actually happening because it, it turns around and bites them in the ankle. So contextualizing the, con the stories, diversifying the testimonies or the sources. So our, our um, demographer in the group would, would understand the importance of that, that in the process 
of verifying information and ensuring that you're getting the highest quality information, the single source story is not the, 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 the best story. It's not the ideal situation. A very important as well is to acknowledge the role of the, the frontline people. I spoke about Mr. Cunningham last week, um, suggesting that we pay attention to what the nurses have to say. We understand, we have to understand the, the situation they're in. But I think that we need to represent their, their we need to tell us uh, the true story of their experience. Okay. Coming, I'm, I'm coming, don't worry, I'm coming to the point of all of this very soon. Just set in the brongo, brongo. What are among some of the more important mandates? Which is managing and presenting data, statistics, and using data visualization um, within the course of these, the series, we do have a focus on the use of data and statistics and data visualization. We have an expert in this stuff and she's going to be coming on later during this session. And we need to look at the multidimensional nature of the stories. I think if we get these issues straight in our head, then we're going to now start paying attention to what are the sources, um, open sources, and I, I don't particularly favor the use of the term open sources because there's a specific application of the of the term open source when it comes to IPSUs and software and so on. But um, the sources that are readily available without necessarily having to fight anybody or to get a freedom of expression, a freedom of information petition or to file a request through your, um, your access to information law. But basically readily available information. So before I move on, any questions or comments about what I've said so far? Good. I hope it is because people are listening. And... Okay, one of the things that we need to get right is the language. As I said before, these are very peculiar circumstances and the languaging of our stories is very important but that we also need to have a very clear understanding of what these new terms mean. What are these expressions? What is the value of these expressions? And in doing the research, I found that some of the most useful glossaries where they basically go through word by word, some of the new concepts and expressions, some of the better ones, I think the Paho one is is excellent. The link is there and you'll get this presentation so you can always um, go there. IJNet presents the glossary in, within the context of journalism. So um, it's not as extensive as the PAHO one, but it focuses on those words and terms that we use every day in our COVID-19 reporting. Anybody here um, acquainted with the IJNet um, resource? Nobody? Okay, two people. Paula, you need to unmute. I see two people have their hands up. Paula and oh, somebody yeah, else. Yeah, I know. I didn't know about the IJ network. I think it's a very good one. Yeah, the IJ net one is, is really good. Somebody else had their hand up. Sparkle. Sparkle McIntosh? No, um, I raised my hand for the question that I answered previously. Okay. There is another really good resource which is which comes through wired.com. And it's also journalistically slanted. Um, very good glossary, very extensive. And Yale Medicine, in fact, if, I don't know if how many of you have been um, referencing Yale Medicine, um, because I know there is this um, preoccupation with some of us with, when it comes to the, to the US resources and um, some of them are not as useful as we, 
consider them to be because they tend to be very parochial and focused on the US situation, which is not our situation by any means. So those are just four useful resources in terms of getting the language right. And as I suggested in one of the earlier slides, <clears throat> one of your obligations is to explain these terms or to break these terms down in a way that people would understand. Uh, hopefully, hopefully people get a chance to read my column tomorrow because I focus on two of them, not in a COVID, um, not in a pure COVID context, but the use, and as I said, personal prejudice, um, the use of the term pre-existing condition and comorbidities, and the fact that we've been using them interchangeably. Um, the, the real experts in this could, could tell you that there, there might be subtle uh, issues to be dealt to attended to. But the language, the use of the language is very important. And I would say that you should consult with these resources just to make sure that you've been getting the language right. Not only, and not only us, um, the, 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 official, the public officials who are presenting the information, the very fine professionals throughout the Caribbean, what we have found during this period is that we have some really outstanding professional people in the public health system. And how many of us were shaking? I say, but where was she all this time? You know, where was he? Um, and, and, and the fact of the matter is that we do have them around and we should make use of them because in, in most instances, they are senior enough in the system to offer comment or even off the record clarification on an issue. Any questions about the language before we move on? So these are resources we can use. The global sources, don't worry, I'm coming. Um, and in, in this list, we have regional sources as well. So, Two or three of you tell me where when you're ref, when you're trying to get the global figures uh, where do you go to get them if you want to get global information where do you go to get that information I should not brought up the slide yet Glenda Ann. I say um, well based upon my knowledge so far the World Health Organization is where um, I would usually go online to get my global information statistics. Um, Saran Sampson, I'm just calling people arbitrarily. Yes. Making sure that they're awake. Paula, I'll come to you. Saran Sampson, you there? Or you're connected and you're doing 12 o'clock news. Kern Jeremiah. Where, if you're contextualizing a story, where do you go for your global information on the latest developments with, with um, COVID-19? I actually would have gone to the WHO as well on that information. Um, Terry Ann Oxley. Paula, where do you go? I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I usually check at least two or three websites, which is World Dormital, um, the CDC and the W, no, World Dormital, PAHO, WHO, and then sometimes CDC. Okay, and I see Cyrus um, Seabear from Haiti saying Johns Hopkins. Um, what? Well, the Haiti situation might be a little bit different because there's a connection there with the U.S. situation. But Cyrus, do you want to explain why why do you go there for for for, for global information? Just to to see the data evolution, uh, because uh, we. In Haiti, we have a lot. We are there's a lot of Haitian and the diaspora in New York and Miami and those cities, and then uh, 
and the 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 COVID outbreak in Haiti is very really led to to what happened in the Haitian diaspora at the state. Okay. Anybody else before I move on? Okay. Remember that COVID the COVID nineteen pandemic is not only a matter of public policy, but it's a matter of hard science. Of, of the kind of science that requires a high level of verification and testing and checking. And one of the things that we would have noticed is that the, with respect to the measures, things continue to change. Like the, the most recent advice from the World Health Organization talks about the, um, the inadvisability of lockdowns. Now that is a story. Um, I don't know when. When next do we have Annalisa? When next we have a Ministry of Health press conference? Um, today is should Tuesday. Be, should be tomorrow. Tomorrow, right? Yeah. Ninety-nine percent guarantee that that question is going to be raised. In fact, I see somebody did a story today on it. Hi, it was raised yesterday. So, okay. Yes, 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 because there's a story today quoting um, the CMO. The CMO. Yes. Anybody right. else from any? That's Trinidad and Tobago. Has anybody else um, encountered this story in their, in their context? And has a question been asked of the public health um, people? And, the, and in this instance, the, the politicians, because what you need is a policy that is policy direction from the government um, based on the scientific advice from the, from the experts. Nazima, has this come up in, in Guyana? Um, Cherise Bovell. Uh, no, it hasn't, uh, Wesley, at least not as yet. Um, but I think like we've had this sort of silent acknowledgement that the government is not going to go this way um, for any further lockdowns because since we've had a new government um, in August, we've seen some massive outreaches. Um, and even though there have been some adjustments to the public health measures, there is no Hmm. For the want of a better word, enforcement of, of, of these measures. Um, so I really don't think that they're going to go that way. Um, as you know, our numbers continue to rise. Um, and our uh, debt toll also continues to rise. Um, but you should know that Georgetown is not Diana. So in different yeah. parts of the country, especially on the border with Venezuela, which is largely unmonitored, and on the border with Brazil, um, we would have seen some very high numbers. And the public health campaigns do not necessarily reach the indigenous groupings because of the language barriers, but also they have their own rules by which they operate. So even though some of them may have closed their villages from outsiders, um, they are traversing in and out. And in some cases, uh, a lot of the indigenous people in, in some of those areas would have taken, um, would have gotten infected and they went back to their villages and that's how the population there got infected. So we really have high numbers in regions one and nine, really. Yeah. Sorry, I went on. No, 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 that, that, that's very interesting because it, it, what it's telling us there that in terms of the variety of stories, depending on your particular circumstance, the variety of stories is abundant. And, and these stories go beyond relating what the statistics are that are related to us by the, um, by the public health officials. As useful as they are, don't knock it, because there are some jurisdictions around the world where um, journalists are actually starved of reliable authoritative information, even on, on, on the statistics. And that's because, for a number of reasons. In some instances, it's because the public health officials don't know. Uh, in the Guyana situation, where you have these borders um, with three different countries, um, Suriname, Venezuela, and, um, and Brazil, it's extremely difficult to 
to, to say with a high degree of authority that X number, but give, especially if you, if, you give a, if you consider constraints on the ability to test. So, but there are, there are stories to be told to explain to people why this might be the case. Um, so the World Health Authority, the World Health Organization, in, in my view, is a single authoritative voice in terms of the global picture. Um, of course, in, in one or two countries, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a political issue about whether you, you, you are considering the authenticity of the work of the WHO. Um, and um, again, that's where we would apply the test um, to ensure that we are that we are weighing or we are attaching weight to the arguments of of some politicians as opposed to um, weight that we attach to the work of science. I'm not getting into what's going to happen in the United States next week or the week after. But, um, that's part of the scenario. So the World Health Organization has anybody um, found yet that the Lancet people know about the Lancet, right? Now, um, when you grow older and you become more of a hypochondriac, you would get to know more of these um, sources, resources. That the Lancet is a very authoritative medical journal. And one of the things that the Lancet did, because usually you would have to pay a lot of money to get the research papers that are published by Lancet, or if somebody publishes it and you can download it somewhere and republish it or, or read it. Um, it's very worth, they have actually opened one corner of their online presence. Um, they're calling it the Coronavirus Research Center. And you can actually go there and look at the latest science. There is science regarding the disease itself and how it's changing. Now, I'm, I'm assuming a certain level of interest in this thing as opposed to, you know, <laughs> but it, it, I think if you have an interest in covering COVID-19, this is one of the places you can go to get a sound scientific understanding. No problem if you have to Google a lot of the terms, no problem if you have to sort of um, check the dictionary. That's no shame in that. As I said, humility is a part of it. But the Coronavirus Resource Center of the Lancet, and the link is there, is very useful. And you know what I came across um, looking at, at there as well? Is the Lancet has also made available um, what they have at their, um, they do a directory on pharmaceuticals. And because there's a lot of work now on the, on the vaccine, um, there is this concern about the, the pharmaceutical industry and some of the, the medications and so on that have been looked at um, in terms of not only the vaccine, but in terms of the prevention. And in the process, what I've done is to open the entire database on, on um, pharmaceuticals. So I was able to, um, to look up the latest issue on metformin. How many of you are aware of the advice uh, being put out about met the use of metformin? No. Here, particularly worrying because my mother used metformin. Yeah. No, it's not necessarily as alarmist as the stories we've been seeing. If you look at the science of it, it's not necessarily as alarming, but it's the Lancet now, which is an authoritative me medical journal, high science from all over the world, they are publishing advice and information on this particular issue. While we live in a part of the world where um, the, the, um, the uh, non-communicables are, are prevalent, Trinidad and Tobago is a world leader, for example, on, on diabetes and hypertension. Um, and those are two conditions that I myself am concerned about and I'm a, I'm a metformin user. So as I said, when you get older, you become afflicted by, affected by different conditions. You become more curious and you try to look at the authoritative sources as opposed to the guy down the road who's selling some bush medicine and who tells you if you get, expo if you're exposed to somebody with COVID-19, run quick and pick that bush and make a tea out of it. Okay. 
Um, I think that these are the things that we can help our readers or audiences with in terms of presenting to them digestible scientific information for them to understand the situation a lot better. PAHO is our hemispheric um, source, uh, PAHO, which comes out of WHO, and then out of PAHO and associated with PAHO is CAFA. Now, the CAFA, CAFA has started producing what they call dashboards. Um, if you look at the daily reporting from Trinidad and Tobago, you'll see that more or less they're adopting the dashboard model. I think Jama uh, Jamaica and Guyana use a sort of dashboard model, but we need to look at it critically because in Trinidad and Tobago, the dashboards that are used or the graphics that are presented every day omit one vital piece of information. One of the trainees, what is that? Glenda? Um, Glenda. I Sorry, would no. ask that question, Wesley, because I, I had this conversation with one of my colleagues just yesterday. Uh, the Ministry of Health in Trinidad and Tobago changed the lineup of how they would do their daily um, clinical updates. And I noticed that they have not been seeing the number of new deaths. And I had a huge problem with that because I felt as though now we're left to assume when these deaths would have taken place since we have gone from, I, I believe, two clinical updates a day to now one. Yes. So it's a matter of keeping track and then going back to previous releases to keep up to date with the number of deaths. And now we have to say when these deaths would have taken place instead of having the information readily available to us. Exactly. Yes. And, uh, because, sorry, um, Paula, Paul, you go ahead. Yes, no, because you can access it on the, the website, but it often goes up later than the time of the actual release. And yes, yeah, they tell you the release is on the website actually has the information that the previous releases, but it's an extra step that as a journalist sometimes um, you don't have time to take. Or you shouldn't have to take that time if the ministry is going to be providing this information for you. Exactly. But yes, the death, it, it, it doesn't have like where people are in the, um, in the various hospitals. It doesn't have how many people are in certain facilities. Well, disaggregated, that's how we were accustomed to. So there's a lot of compression of information that that's for, that doesn't necessarily make anybody's life easier. So at the press conference tomorrow? Oh, well, I raised it the same night with the, the, the public person, but they say that's what they do. I mean, mm -hmm. that maybe somebody could actually bring it up and say, yeah. why are we not deciding the thing? It's a step backward. I mean, I, I wasn't pleased with the way they were presented in the first place because the very last statistic that appeared on the releases were the fatalities. And again, depending on the perspective from which you are entering the picture, um, you would be you would have a very strong concern concern about the fatalities and also about the profiles. I don't know if Richard is with us. Richard is with us today uh, from Trinidad, Richard. Because Richard has been um, pounding away at one particular question at the, in the press conferences in Trinidad and Tobago, which has to do not only with the, um, the profiles of those who have passed, but where the deaths occurred. And I noticed that on Saturday that question was answered, um, but it, we probably need a little more um, drilling down in terms of the details. I only have two minutes left, unfortunately. So let me just get one come any comment from anybody else elsewhere um in the region about the how the, the material is presented and what information is presented um not in particular this is glenda Ann here because that student um mm -hmm. not in particular about how the information was presented but um you strike a nerve when you talked about um, being a diabetic and in terms of the medication with the metformin, 
Yes. Right? So what question arose in my mind now, um, seeing over a period of time when they were talking about um, this other drug, which is the hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. right? And in Trinidad, unfortunately, when this news was spreading like rampage and Donald Trump was talking about he's taking it and this one is talking about they're taking it, um, I believe it's the Lupus Society yes. who, who uses this drug. Yeah. Um, people started coming on the news stating, well, we can't get the medication and they were begging for, you know, for people to return the drug. So now I'm saying with having this information with the metformin now, if this was to be leaked out into, into the public under the, the wrong guidelines or misinformation, as we would call it, could this create yet another yes. mini pandemic in any society? Well, yeah, but it can't because, you know, if diabetics go without their medication, they become far more vulnerable to a whole variety of, um, of conditions, including COVID-19. And something, a point that was missed, I saw a story somewhere in the, is Jamaican press, if you have anybody from Jamaica here, talking about the metformin issue. And what the important bit of information has left out of it is that, is that the concern is about metformin extended release. Um, those of us who use the medication would know that you have the regular metformin and you have the extended release um, capsules. And the concern is about that because the whatever drug they use to gradually release the drug into your system, um, that is that has it has been found in the case of one brand of it um, that it, it can be potentially cancer cause lead to cancer. But if we re if we report it um, in an ill-informed manner, what you're going to do is you're going to have people who are going to be tempted to come off the drug. And that's what you don't want. Uh, so it is very much a COVID-19 story. It's not a metformin recall story. Um, it's not even as much a cancer story as it is a COVID-19 story. Because if people believe that the metformin is going to be poisoning their systems or whatever it is, or leading to cancer, then they're going to be tempted to stop using it. Okay, let me, very quickly before Kiran cuts me off, as she usually does, what, what, are, what are the angles? What are the global stories? Aviation is a big story. And aviation is very pertinent, particularly with the, to the extent that most of our countries have a level of travel restrictions, uh, air travel restrictions. And because of the air travel restrictions, there is the cascading effect on different sectors and there's an impact on the aviation industry itself. Those of us from the OECS countries and so on would understand the impact it has had on LIAT and the emergence of a competitor airline and so on. Those are stories that are, um, yeah. Okay, Gabi coming to Venezuela in a short while. Yeah, those are stories that, um, that are essentially COVID-19 stories. Um, and and, and that, that requires a level of, of science. It requires a, a, an understanding of the public policy issues. Um, there was a claim, um, because, as I said, in election time, I heard it said from a political platform in Trinidad and Tobago that we were the only country in the world that had closed our borders to our nationals. Totally untrue. Fact check these things. You know, um, Australia used to have thousands of citizens of Australia who are quote unquote locked out. So we shouldn't allow people to get away or to, or to blindly use the quotes from politicians or non-experts in that kind of way. We've had issues associated with shipping. Now people would be aware that while um, the cruise ship industry has basically died or entered a, a, a very latent phase, that in terms of the cargo shipping, that it continued, but that there are issues. Most of us come from island states, and island states, we are surrounded by water. We, we rely on shipping for a, a huge variety of things, but we are not seeing the shipping stories. I mean, true, there was a ship, or there probably still is a ship off the shores of Trinidad and Tobago that has been there for months, and the crew 
you know, they come from different parts of the world and so on. The impacts on trade and tourism evident and you've seen piles of stories on, on, on that. How, what is the, the impact on development assistance? The World Bank had a press conference last week um, online and I was a bit disappointed that it was only about six of us on the call and they spoke um, basically about the possible, the likelihood of development as more development assistance coming our way in, in, the, in the case of countries that are on the verge of collapse in the region, but also the whole question of, of debt forgiveness and debt relief. And the, the, the World Bank expert who did the study on Latin America and the Caribbean said that that's not something we should really be looking forward to um, with a high degree of confidence or, or whatever. Um, pharmaceutical industry, this is the, the link to the site I told you about with the, with the drugs. Security becomes an issue. Nationally, well, we know them, the usual suspects, but we need to expand them. So we have the Ministry of Health. We have the whole gamut of government ministries with all the sectors that are affected. We have the organizations, the, um, all the usual suspects as well. Um, and then finally, I wanted to leave with this quote. Um, you're going to get a copy of this presentation, so I don't need to read it out to you. But it talks about really about our um, obligations as, as journalists in covering this, this story, where we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, stress, fear, normal um, reaction. And journalists need to acknowledge that this is the kind of scenario that the pandemic has, uh, has painted for us to address and is something that we would need to pay attention to when doing our stories.